Okay. Uh, now we will proceed towards the next session. And uh, now may I invite Madhurima to start the next session? Madhurima. Thank, thank you. Uh, am I audible? No, audible, Madhurima. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Our second speaker in today's session is Professor Nandini Bhattacharya, professor in the Department of English and Culture Studies, University of Badwan. Before I request ma'am to go ahead with a deliberation in the second session, may I request Professor Shibajyoti Parmokar sir, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Bakura Christian College, to formally introduce Professor Bhattacharya ma'am, over to you Parmokar sir. Thank you, Madhurima. I am really honored to introduce Professor Nondini Bhattacharya, Professor of English, Department of English and Culture Studies, the University of Badwan. Before joining the University of Badwan, Professor Bhattacharya served different, different government colleges of West Bengal and University of Hyderabad as an associate professor and later at West Bengal State University, Barasa. Professor Bhattacharya is an accomplished scholar in the areas of feminist theory, uh, post-colonial studies, transnational and feminist discourses. She is widely published both nationally and internationally. She is a persuasive speaker with a gifted ability to present complex themes in clear and easily comprehensible ways. Professor Bhattacharya has exceptional history of leadership, serving as an academic department chair, the director of a large doctoral program, and a founder of many important interdisciplinary working groups. She has been invited as a professor of professor and head of Department of English and Culture Studies and Dean School of Languages, the Central University of Jammu from 2014 to 2016. She has also held the prestigious post of chairperson of SPORS, which is a committee for women rights and sexual harassment. Central University of Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir. Professor Bhattacharya has been a visiting fellow of University of South Florida and State University of New Jersey, USA in 2006. In India, she has been a visiting fellow of the Department of English with the Sagar University, Medinipur in 2011, in the Department of English, Delhi University, and in Shambhalpur University, Shambhalpur, Urisha, in 2014. She has authored, co-authored many books and wrote a number of articles in national and international reputed journals. To name a few, R.K. Narayan's The Guide, New Critical Idioms, from Worldview Publishers in 2004, a love song to our own real selves, Problematics of Identity in the Novels of Salman Rushdie in 2005, Mulukrat Anand's Untouchable in 2006, Narratives of Frailty, Sarchandra Chattopadhyay and the Colonial Encounter in 2007, and many more. We are really honored to have such a dignitary as a speaker in our international web lecture series. Today, Professor Bhattacharya will talk on reading houses in Jane Austen's novels. And I am sure that her lecture will provide us with illuminating insights, not only for the students, but also for the research scholars and for all the faculty members. Now, may I request Professor Nomdini Bhattacharya, Madam, to go ahead with her deliberation. Ma'am, please. Thank you for a very kind introduction, and uh, I believe that I, I am I am most beholden to the department, and especially to the head uh, and Oyon, because they have been in contact with me. But all the members of the department who are making these contact programs possible, and who are making students feel less lonely. You see, so, you know, it's very important for that this communion is happening, this communion between students and teachers who are divided by the coronavirus. 
and divided by contagion the, that this department of Bakuda Christian College has organized these webinars is one way of such a communion that is going to happen between us or is happening between us who are older versions of you all and our um, students, I mean, who are younger versions of us. So it, it is in this context and in no other uh, great, uh, you know, uh, sense of hierarchy that I would like to present my thoughts on Jane Austen's uh, Mansfield Park in particular, but the uh, anthropomorphizing of houses in uh, eight, late 18th, early 19th century literature. I have uh, presented a, a PPT, uh, which would sort of help you all. But uh, just to state that the, you know, if you have seen a recent movie on Prime called Gulabo Sitaro, then you would have sort of understood or maybe seen an older movie called Garam Hawa, you would have possibly understood the question of anthropomorphizing houses, that is making houses human. All right, so uh, giving a house certain qualities. Now in the uh, 18th and in the 19th centuries, great country houses came up and these great country houses were also built around great parks and, and, and avenues and water bodies. And all this was beautifully curated because uh, it, is, it is the conjoining of art and nature that was the ideal that would be presented. Now, uh, you see, when we are talking about such houses, we have to understand that houses stand for something. Houses are not, uh, you know, brick and mortar, but houses stand for something very, very important, which is why I would ask you to go to Prime, uh, at Amazon Prime and see Gulabo Sitaro, where in the end, the character of Amitabh Bachchan, he said, I mean, when he's asked by Bakke, as to why that old lady married him. He said it was, or why he married that old lady. He said that it was because of the Haveli. It was because of the house. So houses have their own attraction. Houses have their own uh, qualities as it were. Now, when we are talking about the 18th century, when we are talking about the uh, late 18th, early 19th century and these great country houses, we must be reminded of the sources of money for the building of these houses. All right. Now, what, what were the sources? Now, most of these country houses, if you see my PPT, which I on my put it up, uh, uh, Obinobo Mondo, are you there? Obinobo Mondo, yeah, please begin presentation. Yes. yes. Madam, is visible? Yes. If you, if you see the PPT, then you will find that I have included a, uh, a chora, a little sort of, you know, rhymed uh, piece by Jonathan Swift, which talks about this connection between plantations, between slavery and the great houses of the uh, 18th centuries. So uh, that is something I think is very, very important. I mean, the great houses were built on the money that was accrued from the plantations, especially the sugar plantations in the Caribbeans in places like Barbados, in places like Antigua, and in other islands as well. Now, the brutality of a plantation uh, and the brutality of slavery in these plantations is, you know, contrasted with the order and the beauty of the great houses of the 18th century. Now, I mean, 
in fact uh, i mean it, it's 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 something that you will have to pay attention to that the house is actually produced by the money that was accrued through this cruelty through the perpetration of uh, this uh, cruelty and this uh, practice of slavery in or deploying of slave labor in these uh, plantations now the deploying of slave labor in plantations remember uh, continued even though uh, uh, technically there was an abolition of slavery in 18 33 now usually mansfield park is read in conjunction with this declaration of abolition of slavery post uh, edward said's reading of mansfield park in culture and imperialism however we will come to that a little later but simply say that the romantic movement that you read about the talk about nature that you are you know enjoying to write in your exam papers when you are asked about romanticism and nature or uh, the features of romanticism or a great deal to monies that were coming monies that were coming from these plantations and colonies and it is these monies which went on to curate nature so the natural description of the y valley w y e or the descriptions of the ruins of the tintern monastery the tintern abbey these are all you know part of memoirs of people who went on to tour these great houses these great monasteries at a moment of great building you know a surge of monument and house building monastery building and uh, these monies came from the various plantations and colonies so you know i'm making a point that uh, i'm making a fairly acute point that when one is talking about or when one is reading about nature in uh, romantic poetry one ought to look at nature not in the raw not as it is presented in hardy for example not something ferocious not something uh, you know uh, unbounded but nature that has been curated nature that has been uh, controlled nature that has been subdued and which has been made into beautiful parks beautiful uh, avenues and so on and so forth and mostly this is a kind of nature that accompanies a house so i think this would enthuse you to go back to your you know answer to uh, romanticism and adding nature as a feature of that romantic movement uh, in a little more textured and dense way and understand that this fascination with nature and especially fascination with a garden space is has a certain material basis that means that the nature was i mean which wordsworth is admiring is not just there or the nature that keats is admiring in to one who has long been in city pent is just not there but has been created through human effort and a lot of landscape uh, makers you know and architects whose money comes from these plantations and plantations in which slaves live in terrible conditions you see they are packed together like animals in barracks so you can look at some of the tea plantations in our own country and some of the pictures that are provided and you will have a fair understanding of the inhuman or the bestial way in which the slaves which produce this money are kept and it is this money that goes on to produce that beauty that order of nature that you appreciate in romantic poetry and in romantic novels like mansfield park 
Now, when one is talking about Mansfield Park, I mean, uh, one has to remember that Jane Austen, uh, this is the only novel of Jane Austen in which which she named, which she named after a place, after a house. I mean, Northanger Abbey was actually named by her brother. It wasn't named by herself because Northanger Abbey was published after Jane Austen's death. Therefore, we have to give a little importance to this act of naming. I mean, why is uh, uh, this uh, named as Mansfield Park? That is important. I mean, the house is the character. And when we are talking about Mansfield Park, we are also talking about the Portsmouth House, which is put as its other, which is put as its contrast. And after Fanny has come back, after having lived in Mansfield Park for some time, she finds the Portsmouth House to be confined, smelly, dirty, and most uh, anesthetic, you know? It's almost as if one is comparing the barracks of the slaves to the, uh, to the beautiful houses and nature of, uh, of 18th century England or early 19th century England. Mansfield Park, I think, was published in 1814. So, but it refers to the, uh, you know, the, the great surge of house building and estate building in the 18th century, you know, from, uh, you know, the beginning of the 18th century. But as I mentioned in 1833, technically, the, uh, the, uh, there was an abolition of slavery. Now, Mansfield Park takes its name from Lord Mansfield, who had given a great judgment, a great ruling with regard to a slave called Somerset and who had said that he had his rights as a man and as a human being and could not be forced back into plantation. Now, let me give this very simply, you know, uh, he, uh, the uh, chattel slave is someone who does not have any human rights. Now, today, when we are talking about Black Lives Matter, when we are mourning the death of Floyd's, uh, you know, killing by a police officer, we have to look back to this whole idea of whether a black life matters at all. You know, and uh, this slave Somerset, who was a house servant in England, who had, uh, you know, whose master wanted to push him back to a plantation. And this is something which he did not want to do. And so he registered a case. Now, this itself is, you know, phenomenal because, I mean, if you are registering a case against your master, it means that you have a contract with your master and not just and you are not his property i mean a property cannot say that i am not going to do so and so suppose you own a table lamp all right the table lamp can't go to the court and say i'm not going to stay in this corner of the room i want to stay in another corner of the room the table lamp doesn't have a say whereas a you know therefore this ruling or judgment is very very important and the fact that Somerset was given such a ruling by Lord Mansfield, and there are, there are other reasons as to why Lord Mansfield was sympathetic towards the person of color. That is another story which we can do another day, but this was a historic judgment. So in all probability, Jane Austen used the name of Mansfield as a sort of directive you see, so when you are going to read Mansfield Park, you remember the connection between the great houses of the 18th and 19th centuries and their connection to chattel slavery, their connection to plantations, their connections to the ways in which money from the colonies and especially from plantations were brought in 
to England to augment its nature. Now, what is the meaning of the word augment its nature? This means that nature is not enough. I mean, nature has to be curated. Nature has to be controlled. Nature has to be given a direction. Otherwise, nature is vicious. I mean, something Hobbesian. Okay. nasty, brutish. So one can't talk about nature in the romantic period in a sort of, you know, uncritical way. One has to be a little more attentive to the reasons, to the historical reasons as to why romanticism is associated with nature. So this is as much a lecture on for the students who are assembled on the idea of nature in romanticism or romanticism as uh, engaging with nature as it is on the anthropomorphizing or making human of houses in the 18th century. I mean, they are connected just as a uh, house is uh, made human. So also nature is made human. All right. And it is this process of making nature human it is a process of control. It is a process of constant pruning, constant controlling of uh, you know, vegetation and other things, the, the unruly aspects of nature. So uh, uh, quickly, um, uh, when, uh, when we look at the house of Matthew Park, we have to go on to also look at the plantation in Antigua that is producing the money. Now, Lord, uh, the, the, uh, the owner of Mansfield Park is Lord Bertram, Thomas Bertram. He is what you could call a sugar baron. All right. Now, a sugar baron is someone who makes his money on sugar. All right. Just like the Ambani's are called polyester princes because the Ambani's make money on polyester. So they are sugar barons and there were many sugar barons because most of the money of English gentlemen came either from cotton or from sugar. All right. There also a lot of money did come from people who had been administrators and who were sort of, you know, fed on large amount of graft, goose in the colonies like India. So they were also called the Nabobs. So, so three kinds of uh, money, I think. One from plantation, tea, coffee, sugar, one uh, and cotton, and uh, one from graft and other kinds of money uh, from the colonies in administrative positions. These were the two major, uh, you know, borrowlooks. They, they, rich people in 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 the uh, in in 18th century england that is when the high tide of colonialism had you know had struck so simply i mean this these are the points that i want to make number 1 that uh, that the process of colonization has to be linked to the writing of these great 18th century, early 19th century novels that, uh, you know, the obsession with nature is not something sudden, transcendental and free flowing, but connected to the materiality of England's money coming from these plantations. And this is again an interesting thing that in the plantations, and this includes the tea plantations of Assam, nature is seen as something that has to be uh, extracted, you know, that has to be exploited. It's a very utilitarian approach to nature. Whereas within England, the approach to nature is that it produces beauty and uh, aesthetic feelings. So nature is good in itself. I mean, when one is reading Wordsworth, one is talking of nature as something that will lead you to God. So nature is something that is divine. But within the um, uh, colonies, nature is described as garden and as wasteland. Wasteland are the places 
which must be utilized. So a plantation is basically a wasteland concept because it is there that you utilize the land to maximum. Neel chash bolo, um, coffee producing, uh, sugar producing, cotton producing. These are, you know, cash crops. These are high yielding. These have lot of, these required a lot of water. And these destroy the land because, you know, you are exploiting the land without giving it even a certain fallow period without allowing it to recover. You are trying to extract the maximum from a piece of land. And also when you are inhabiting the slaves, you are also pushing them into little rooms within barracks and you are trying to extract the maximum from their bodies. But when you this money comes into England, then there is a transformative uh, you know, dimension. So nature becomes beauty, nature becomes divine, and uh, the 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 uh, houses become also, uh, you know, they stand for the beauty of human beings. They stand for the dignity of human beings. So, what I'm trying to say is that dignity of nature and dignity of the great houses of the 18th, 19th centuries are produced by the indignity of the indignity of nature and indignity of human beings in the uh, margins, in the colonies. It is by, uh, you know, instrumentalizing, please note this word, it is by utilizing, it is by instrumentalizing a human being and instrumentalizing nature that one can produce the uh, beauty and aesthetics of nature and human beings in the, uh, in the metropolis. Now, what is the meaning of this word instrumentalize? I mean, this is a Kantian idea that when you are meeting another human being, you must give that human being dignity. That is that human being is priceless. You see, it is beyond any price. It, uh, your relation with a human being is not transactional. Similarly, Wordsworth and Keats and Coleridge appear to say that your relation with nature is non-transactional. You are, you know, nature is good in itself, all right? And in fact, it can be a passage to divinity, even if you don't believe that nature itself is divine, all right? Whereas in the colonies, nature is seen as something that has to be instrumentalized. In other words, it does not have any innate dignity, but is simply like maybe a maybe a pen, I mean, which you use and throw, all right? You don't do that to your friend, do you? I mean, you with your friend, you, uh, you are friends for life. I mean, you don't depend on a friend for his or her use. Amar bondhu, amar kon kaji ashbe. That is not bondhu. Whereas a pen is not as good as you can use it. You can throw it away. So this is the difference between nature and houses in the romantic period. While in the metropolis, the house and the nature that surrounds the house or maybe is part of the house is uh, is you know, is dignified in itself. And when one studies romantic poetry or romantic literature, one has to take into account the material basis of such beauty. The fact that such beauty and dignity is produced by the, uh, you know, the uh, utilitarian approach to land and to labor in the colonies. Now, um, uh, I think I don't have too much time left, is it? Ayun? Madam, go ahead. Please. No problem okay. with time. Okay. So, uh, you know, with uh, the uh, with Mansfield Park, let me sort of quickly go over Mansfield Park. In Mansfield Park, there are two houses. In fact, there are three houses. All right. The houses from which the Crawfords come. But nevertheless, uh, in Mansfield Park, you have two kinds of, uh, I mean, 
quickly uh, there is a little girl called fanny price who arrives from portsmouth to mansfield park because she is the daughter of uh, uh, you know mrs price who is the sister of the lady of uh, mansfield park and uh, uh, you know the the wife of mr bartram the wife of lord bartram so basically fanny is uh, i mean mrs bartram or lady bartram is fanny's aunt she is sister to mrs price now obviously the two houses are different the two houses one is smelly and crowded and mr price has been a silly man he has also produced many children this is in contrast to the mansfield park house where there is dignity and order there are two sons and two daughters so even in the production of children there is an order and when fanny uh, comes there initially she feels very very small she is made to feel very small by miss norris but uh, who is another of her aunts but later on she makes her own place in this house and she becomes the future mistress of the house given that you know it is she who is responsible it is she who is quiet and it is she unlike uh, lady bartram who takes charge of things in the house there is a transformative moment when uh, the crawfords and the uh, the bartram siblings want to produce a play which is a little risk r i s q u e which is a little you know maybe not fit for young children and uh, so that is something fanny refuses to participate in so here again i talk about the anthropomorphizing of the house the house and its dignity the house and its respectability are as important as the dignity of lord bartram lord bartram has gone off to the caribbeans to quell a revolt a slave revolt in a sugar plantation and that is when these children seem to take over but fanny is the only child who refuses to participate in this and when lord bartram comes back he breaks down all the props and theatrical accruements and he is uh, you know he rewards fanny for her uh, you know quiet dignity as it were now uh, finally there are uh, there is uh, one thing i'd like to say and then i would like to invite a few questions because uh, it's already quite late and i'm sure people are hungry that is there have been two approaches to the reading of mansfield park which is only one among the many romantic novels and romantic literature about buildings all right like tintern abbey that portion of tintern abbey tintern abbey itself is part of a larger poem is about buildings all right so i would like my students to be a little more conscious about the uh, you know the building within nature not nature as in uh, rock stones and trees but also nature as a built structure which protects nature or gives nature its uh, a pivot as it were the house is at the center of a park so you know the house as it were holds together the natural beauty so there is a uh, design behind all of this now uh, two kinds of um, two kinds of uh, approaches one an older one by edward said in which he compares uh, the crushing of the revolt in the antigua sugar plantations by lord thomas bartram to his crushing of the revolt within mansfield park and uh, his uh, you know bringing back the house to order but there has been a revisionist approach in which one shows the close connections between jane austen and her affinity towards lord mansfield and his family and affinity towards mansfield's great judgment 
about the rights of a slave. I come back again to what is very contemporary, that Black Lives Matter. Why must one still preface the word life with Black Lives Matter? Because obviously they don't matter. Okay, that is that is why we are still talking about Black Lives Matter. So instead of all lives matter. So black makes, black reminds you of this history of slavery and this history of instrumentalizing a human body. Now within England, this is the new, uh, you know, the new theses that are coming up that Jane Austen was actually pro-abolition. She was not anti-abolition. I mean, she was, she celebrated Mansfield's judgment and uh, you know, because Norris is a Dustu Lok in Dustu Mohila in this novel, Norris was also the name of one of the lawyers who had fought against abolition. So all these show that Jane Austen was pro-abolition, and that Mansfield Park is about it celebrates the abolitionist uh, thing, the abolitionist policy. Now this schizophrenia. You see, obviously, this is something that is difficult to uh, work out through a reading of Mansfield Park. But this schizophrenia is interesting because Britain continued to support slavery in places other than its own uh, you know, geographical borders. So within England, slavery was abolished. But in the plantations, in other places, slavery continued. It was later replaced by indentured labor, but within England, you know, and its laws of liberty and human equality, the question of the slave trade was abolished because it uh, you know, it made a human being into an instrument. So the fact that Fanny becomes a self, Fanny becomes a person by herself, also shows the coming out of a slave as it were. I mean, uh, Fanny's own position was little better than a slave when she had come in. So this schizophrenia is a healthy schizophrenia. You know, so I'm, there are two approaches, one that this is an anti-abolitionist novel, and two, that it is a pro-abolitionist novel. Now, I am I don't mind this either or because I find both to be in dialogue and both to be a productive place to read Mansfield Park and to read romantic literature as engaged in houses and nature and nature in houses. Thank you. And thank you for such an enthralling, insightful, and thought provoking lecture. Now, may I again request Professor Oyan Mundosa, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, to Bakura Christian College, to conduct the interactive session. Uh, thank you, Udrima, for once again giving me this chance. Uh, Madam, I have a question in the chat box. Can I ask them directly? Yes, yes, please, please. please. Uh, it's from Tathavato Bosch. Uh, mm -hmm. He asks, Jane Austen's novels have been popular for over 200 years, despite mm -hmm. the fact that the world she lived in no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Life prejudice in particular has been repeatedly adapted for plays and movies. Mm -hmm. Why is Austen's novel still so popular with people mm -hmm. returning to the story and adapting it mm -hmm. in different cultures and times? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, though this has really nothing to do with my lecture, nevertheless, Jane Austen, I think, is popular because Jane Austen has a narrative. And, uh, you know, South Asians are very fond of narratives. I mean, it is this uh, beginning that contributes to a middle and a middle that contributes to an end, you know. It is this narratival structure of Jane Austen that gives us a peculiar pleasure because a narrative gives us a sense of order, a sen sense of, uh, you know, that uh, all wrongs will be righted. Therefore, it is this uh, narratival depth or pivot of Jane Austen's novels which give it a, a enduring value. I mean, people like or love stories and Jane Austen 
has solid stories and solid stories which are interspersed with relational complexities. Now this, though I'm doing a bit of stereotyping, I still believe that South Asians are family oriented and they love stories with which have relational complexities and which have a beginning that contributes to the middle that contributes to the end. Thank you, Madam. The next question is from a faculty member of a college, Mitra Chandigrahi. Uh, she yes. asks us, do you feel, Madam, there has been some sort of an evolution in terms of anthropomorphizing houses from mm -hmm. the Romantic times to the Victorian times? For example, if we talk about Miss Havisham's house in mm -hmm. the Credit mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This is a good question. This is a good question and I will have to think about it. You see, by the time uh, one is talking about Victorian houses, England is a settled power. And therefore, there is a tendency to uh, taxidermize, as it were, you know, to sort of uh, uh, congeal into some sort of a hoary old thing, such houses. And if you remember that Miss Havisham herself is taxidermized. She is an old woman who wants to protect an old moment when she wanted to get married and when she was jilted. So taxidermy is the art of uh, preserving something that is dead. So yes, if you are talking about an evolution, then I think this is an interesting point that while houses are more living and vibrant elements in the 18th century, by the end of the 19th, there begins a fetishizing of these houses and making them into objects which are, you know, which uh, whose vitality is gone, but which is still preserved, you know, as if it is still vital, as if it is still real. So good thank point. You, thank you, Madam. Uh, this is a question probably by a student, Tonmoy Dash. Mm -hmm. Madam, was not Austin criticizing the idea of improving nature through Fanny Price when Fanny mm -hmm. expressed that she would rather see uh, Southerton in its original beauty than improved by Mr. Rasworth? Yes, I mean, uh, you see, again, uh, Southerton is the other house in uh, uh, in the novel, but uh, I would, you know, contest this idea. I mean, there isn't any yes or no in this. I mean, you, I, I, I agree. I mean, you stick to your point. But my idea would be, my contention would be that Fanny is part of the improvement. You see, when she comes into uh, Mansfield Park, Mansfield Park is almost entirely being run by Mrs. Norris. I mean, and there is an absentee, uh, the uh, you know, ha house owner. The, uh, uh, Thomas Bertram has to run off to London for various parliamentary duties. And Lady Bertram is a lazy, irresponsible woman. Therefore, the house lacks a center. The house lacks a moral center. Why is Fanny treated so badly in the beginning? I mean, had Lord Bertram had his way, then there would be justice and dignity given to this little girl who is actually related to them and who has been brought here on an act of charity. If one looks at the etymology of the word charity, it doesn't mean throwing a bone at a dog. It means love, unconditional love. So where is that justice? Where is that love in... Uh, Mansfield Park at the beginning of the novel. At the end of the novel, when Fanny is being married off to the younger son of the Bertrams, there is a definite indication that the moral center of Mansfield Park will now shift from Lord and definitely Lady Bertram to Fanny Price, because uh, who will become Fanny Bertram, because she is the one who is responsible and she is the one who will protect this house from moral misdemeanors. Obviously, the enacting of the lover's vows, had it gone through, would have meant a infraction of the dignity of that house. So therefore, I stick to my idea that uh, Fanny is 
uh, is introduced in Mansfield Park as a part of its improvement plan. Fanny is the best thing that happens to Mansfield Park because she is quiet in her own way and she can blend with Mansfield Park. She's not overwhelming like the Crawfords. She comes from a poor family and therefore she can be its gatekeeper as it were. You know? you know a gatekeeper, someone one can't see but who is vital for the maintenance of that house. Yes, Dev Jita, I think, has a question. Yes, Dev Jita has a question. Man, yes. Can Mansfield Park be read from the point of view of fairy tale motive? As Fanny, an orphan, at the end becomes the mistress of the true, house. True, we true. think that the house is true. working a tool here. True. I mean, of course, see, when one is talking about uh, the novel as a genre, and one is going back to Ian Watts, The Rise of the Novel, there is a great emphasis on rupture, that the novel is, you know, is unprecedented. Is, uh, it's something that had never happened before, and the novel is very real. That is, realism is the base word of novel. The novel was there because uh, there was a need for bourgeois realism. And the bourgeoisie wanted the novel because they wanted realism. Now, this is an idea that is has been undercut by theorists such as scholars such as Michael McKeon and a little earlier, I think, Northup Fry. They talk about the novel structure as devolutionary rather than evolutionary. What is evolution? That there is something that is stunted and small and putative, and then it becomes something that is full and great. All right, unlike such a view, if you talk of the novel as not evolving from certain inferior forms, such as the fairy tale or the romance, but you look at the novel as in conversation with earlier forms and as utilizing those forms in or contemporanizing those forms, I think it will make more sense. All right. So, of course, the fairy tale, the romance is a very important part of novel writing. And I would ask uh, the question uh, maker to also go on to read uh, Jane Eyre which is a classic fairy tale of a Cinderella girl, Cinderella kind of figure. So is Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park adopts the, uh, you know, unquestioningly adopts the plot of Cinderella, the poor young girl who goes on to marry a prince and occupy a great house. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you, Madam. And this is the last question. We are already testing your patience. Uh, no, there, no, is no. Pattern, there is a pattern of binary presentation of houses, both in Pride and Prejudice, uh, mm -hmm. for example, Bennett Houses, Pemberley Houses, and Watering Heights, Watering mm -hmm. Heights itself, and Thrush Cross Grant. In yes. spite of the text being belonging to two different historical periods, mm -hmm. there is also Thornfield Hall in Jane Eyre, standing mm -hmm. as an anthropomorphic house, a set mm -hmm. of schizophrenic tribes. Your, mm. your, your take on this one. Yes, I think this is a good question. And I would have spoken about Thornfield Hall normally. I mean, uh, I, I actually wanted some people to ask me this question instead of me talking about it. Thornfield Hall is again a classic uh, house which is built on money from the uh, Caribbeans. All right. And of course, in a later redoing of this novel, I think White Sargasso say there is a greater emphasis on the plantation house okay, in Culibri. And so uh, Thornfield Hall has been much spoken about. Yes, I mean, it is also a house that is built on the money of, uh, of the mad woman in the attic. And I think in the Victorian period, there is a deepening of these sensibilities. You said that there is a deepening of an awareness of the sin of slavery, the burden of slavery. And, uh, and it is that which casts its long shadow upon Thornfield Hall. The name itself is see, far less celebratory than Mansfield Park. 
Okay, Mansfield Park contains within it a sense of celebration because it refers to that great anti-slavery uh, judgment by Lord Mansfield. Whereas Thornfield, uh, you know, refers to some of the thorns that the British colonizers have actually sown and they are going to reap the whirlwind. And it is only in the ethical fitness of things that Thornfield Hall is burnt down. And when uh, uh, Jane Eyre says, reader, I married him, obviously they are not going to live in Thornfield Hall anymore. There is, uh, they, uh, it's a paradise lost, but it's also a paradise regained in the sense that the burning down of Thornfield Hall in a way uh, sort of, you know, sort of squares up the sin of enslaving people and instrumentalizing them and, you know, packing a woman, uh, a mad woman in the attic. So the burning down of Thornfield Hall, I would say, is ethically uh, important, ethically viable. Uh, thank you so much, Madam. I cannot thank you enough on behalf of the department for uh, your scholarly talk and also for your words of uh, encouragement in respect of our hosting this web lecture series. Now over to my uh, student, Modurima. Modurima, are you there? Ma'am, stay with us for one more minute. Yes, I, I just, just one thing, uh, you know, Ayun, I would like to repeat this at the end of my lecture that a lecture in this webinar format, which many people are criticizing, is something that is like a communion because you cannot see the teacher. I mean, literally, of course, you can see the teacher on the webcam. It enhances the idea of what Martin Buber would call a communion. So this, you know, this uh, connection between us and you and this loneliness that we suffer during the contagion is something that has been bridged by this department and I'm very, very beholden for, uh, you know, enacting this communion as it were. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Madhurima, over to you. Madhurima? Yes. Now, may I request, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Th uh, thank now, may I kindly request most of the faculty, students of English, but college, to discuss the book. Thanks. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay. I feel privileged enough to propose on behalf of the Department of English Buffalo Christian College our indebtedness to the two distinguished resource persons today. They are Dr. Sisi Kuba Chatterjee, Associate Professor of PG Department of English, Hukli Mohusin College, and Professor Nondini Bhattacharya, Professor of English and Culture Studies the University of Baduan, who have been kind enough to spare their valuable time for today's lecture despite their hectic schedule. On behalf of all the participants, I acknowledge with sincere gratitude and thankfulness some new perspectives in studies and further researches that they have opened up for us through their insightful and extremely engaging lecture. Thank you, sir, Dr. Chatterjee, and thank you, ma'am, and Professor Bhattacharya. I humbly, I humbly acknowledge the participation of huge number of faculty members of different institutions, students, and researchers of Google Meet and YouTube Live. They have been patient enough to listen to the lectures with rapt attention and inclusive enough to interact with our Libya resource persons. We will meet again tomorrow at 11 a.m. with two eminent speakers, Dr. Shoipot Sarkar from Midnapur College and Dr. Pinaki De from R.P. Mohan College. 
thank you thank, thank you, you so you. much and so thank you madam thank you so thank much you. so thank i'm 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 uh, uh, you know closing this now yes ma'am yes ma okay thank you. okay uh, thank you